small group leaders, our Sunday school class teachers, especially those that are working with junior high. Just kidding, guys. Constantly in prayer. A few chapters later, Peter and John are arrested in chapter 3 and in chapter 4. They go before the Sanhedrin. And, and they're, they're on trial pretty much. And it's, it's not really a legal trial, but they are on trial in front of the Sanhedrin. And they finally are let go. In verse 21 it says, After further threats... They're threatening them. Don't preach about this Jesus character anymore or something worse is going to happen to you. Those are the threats they're getting. It says, after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what was happening. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. And then in verse 23, it talks about on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. They went back to the church. And they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And they all prayed. And then the prayer is recorded here. And in verse 31, this is, this is what I want you to see. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You see what prayer does for the church? It assures them that God is with them and it gives the church the boldness to go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. A couple weeks ago, I, I went to a, a planning meeting for the North American Christian Convention and one of the guys on that committee with me, his name is Lynn Ragsdale and Lynn is a missionary to the Philippines because of visa concerns, he's only allowed to go for 20 days at a time. Every 21 days, he's got to come back. So he, he doesn't go and stay in the Philippines all the time. He just goes over and does some ministry and comes back. But in the part of the Philippines where he is, there, there's a lot of persecution of Christians. And he said they were, the Christians there, the, the local Christian leaders, were really struggling. And, and so on his last trip over there, they, they got together and they all huddled together and they prayed all night long. And he said the next morning, there was a 4.0 earthquake. And he said it was so cool to, to, for those Philippine Christians to go right here to this verse and said, after they had prayed, the place where they were was shaken. He said they, they really felt like God is with us. There's, there's nothing that can stop us now. And they're right. That's what God wants for his people. But only a praying people can have that kind of... That kind of a feeling, that kind of assurance. And so what are we going to be? The church that prays for 10 days or the church that prays for 10 minutes? The second one, we can be an unstoppable church through power. That's what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says at the beginning of the verse, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Up in verse 4, he says, Go to Jerusalem and you wait for the gift my Father has promised. You see, the interesting thing for the church today is the same Holy Spirit that empowered the first century church to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ is available to us. And sometimes we just act like it's not the same power, that it's not the same Holy Spirit that fills us as filled them. But that's not true. It's God's Spirit. It's a God that that doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with the power of that Holy Spirit, we can be an unstoppable church. The first century church was, was accused of turning the world upside down. These same men who have turned the world upside down have now come here. The Thessalonians told the Bereans. Thirdly, we can be an unstoppable church through proper priorities. That's not always easy. Because sometimes to, to have the proper priorities means that we set ourselves up for some pretty painful experiences. I don't know what's going to happen in the future of the United States, but you know it's getting to be more and more hostile for 
Christianity to, to proclaim the truth. Will there be a day when Christians are persecuted in America? When they're jailed for preaching things that are considered politically incorrect even though they're in the Bible? It's a very good possibility. In places like Bosnia and India, places where the gospel is being proclaimed, Christians are being persecuted. Sometimes to the point of people driving by and setting the building on fire while they're having worship services. It's happened a couple times in India lately. Sometimes setting the proper priorities might put us in harm's way. It did for Peter and John. But on two occasions in the first five chapters of the book of Acts, Peter looked at the leaders that were getting ready to beat him or imprison him or perhaps even kill him. And in chapter 3, he says, you judge for yourself whether it is right for us to obey you or to obey God. And over in Acts chapter 5, he said, we can't help it. (laughs) We're going to proclaim the name of Jesus. You see, they set that as their priority, even above their own personal safety. And as a church, if we're going to be unstoppable, we cannot allow fear to keep us in a box that God doesn't intend for us to be in. Because God intends for the church, even today, to still turn the world upside down. In uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 4, here's where things got messy. Because up until now, you know, Peter and John had just uh, been arrested a few times and, and then they were freed. But we come to Acts chapter 8 and all of a sudden, you can read here in the first verse, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. You see, Stephen became the first martyr of the church. The first man murdered for preaching the gospel. But he wasn't the last. But the key isn't in that first couple of verses. The key is down in verse 4 when it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere that they went. You see, they didn't let the persecution stop the proclamation because they had their priorities straight. And they understood that the the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ was so much more important than their own personal safety. And that was one of the things that helped the church to be an unstoppable church in the first century. Number four, we can do it through preaching. And by that I mean the truth. Standing up for the truth. You know, about five years ago, the Christian church, the the New York Times newspaper, put out a a list of the fastest growing church movements in America. And ours, besides the Mormon church, was on top of the list. Mormons were first and we were second. So as far as evangelical churches go, the independent Christian churches were the second fastest growing religious group in America. Do you want want to know why I believe that is? I believe it's because we're willing to stand on what this book says. We're not going to compromise the truth of the gospel so that we can be politically correct or so that we can be culturally relevant. I believe it's important for our message to be relevant to our society but not at the sacrifice of truth. So we really need to stand on what this book says. And we need to preach this gospel. And we need to tell the truth. That's why one of our sermon series in 2011 is going to be if the truth were told. You see, the truth about homosexuality needs to be told. We're not going to be militant and go out with picket signs and, and be hateful because that's not the gospel message to the homosexual community is it not even close we're supposed to be loving those people into the kingdom of Jesus Christ but we also have to proclaim the truth of the gospel Jesus when he talked to the woman in adultery he said neither do I condemn you and then he didn't just let her go he said go your way and sin no more 
If the church isn't going to stand up against sin, who will? And I'm not saying that we have to become judgmental and legalistic because the church is based on grace. But we do need to proclaim that if we want God's blessing in our lives, if we want God's blessing in our marriages, if we want God's blessing on our family, if we want God's blessing on our community, if we want God's blessing on our church, then we have to honor God with the way that we live. It's just simple truth. But much of our society doesn't want to hear the truth anymore. Paul told Timothy, he warned Timothy about that. He said, there will come a time when men will not tolerate sound doctrine. Instead, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will surround themselves with a great number of teachers who will give them anything their itching ears want to hear. We've been warned. But we've also been commanded to stand firm on the truth. Number five, we can be an unstoppable church because of our purpose. There are several verses there. I'm not going to take the time to read those, but in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, I want you to go to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. He kind of outlines our purpose, doesn't he? He wants us to save the world. We need missionaries like Chris because it's going to be tough to reach people in Bosnia without him. We need things like Student Christian Fellowship on the campus at Ohio State. What a great mission field, right in our backyard. People from all over the world come to study at Ohio State. What if we can win them to Christ while they're here and send them back to India and to Pakistan and to Cambodia and Vietnam and Japan with the gospel of Jesus Christ? See, we can become an unstoppable church when we begin to act like the church of the book of Acts. And what if, what if it works? What will God do through us if we are successful? If we experience true spiritual transformation, if we get everybody involved in ministry, and if we begin serving everybody that we come in contact with, with joy? What if? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity today to be encouraged by your word and to know that that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have so much more potential than we sometimes give ourselves credit for. I pray today, Lord, that you will help us as, as your church to see the potential that you've put in this body of believers, to become more dedicated to the truth, to become better communicators of your word and to simply to have our hearts changed so that we can turn the world upside down with and for the gospel of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Today we want to give you the opportunity to become a part of an unstoppable kingdom. Remember it was Jesus who said, even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, if, if you go to the very end of this book, you'll find out that we're going to win. But it's time for us to start fighting a lot of battles between here and, and there. It's time to start winning the battle for the souls of men. That's the church's purpose. And if you want to become a part of that team, if you want to become a part of this ministry, then we invite you today to come and make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life or or just simply come and say, hey, this sounds like something I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of an unstoppable church. If that sounds like you today, I invite you to come forward. I'll meet you right down here in front. Let's stand and sing. Every promise free.